morning and happy Tuesday 10 at 10 to all my uh, friends uh, watching the Tuesday 10 at 10. Uh, the bakers looking for answers with their issues. So thank you for listening. Uh, my name is Richard Charpentier. I'm your host. And without further ado, let's get started with your questions. So uh, I have a question regarding water activity. Somebody uh, sent a message, a question, saying, uh, thank you for all of the information you're sharing, YouTube, etc. I have a question for you. Recently, I had a long and ongoing study about the models of predicting water activity of cake. Well, I finally succeeded to do that by uh, uh, these by finding the sorption isotherm of each individual ingredients participating in the cake batter and calculate the final water activity. But I'm not sure if this water activity is for the batter or the final cake. Does baking temperature or process affect the AW of the cake? I mean, maybe the AW of the batter is 0 0.8, but after baking decreases to 0 0.75. Uh, I happen to know the person, Dr. Lang, who wrote the article on how to calculate the, you know, predict the water activity of a final cake. And him and I spoke uh, based on your question. And basically, the model is there to predict. You know, there are many factors, as you said, to take in place. Uh, did you get all the proper water? Did you get all the right ingredients scaled up properly? How was the bay? How was the moisture loss? And that's why you're seeing a difference from 0.8 to 0.75. But uh, again, as it is intended, it's a predictor. So, you know, at least you know you're going to be 0.5, maybe plus or minus 0 0.05. At least it gives you sense. Once you're making something by calculating, you know, the absorption isotherm and putting them together and coming up with a number, it's a, it's a good tool. Uh, it takes a little while to 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 grasp, but but now you can, you know, by creating a formulation, you can know where you're going to be by just that was the plan on the piece of paper. You already know and predict where you're going to be. So I hope it helped. But that's a very good question and. Uh, and it made uh, Dr. Lang very proud that, you know, some people are still reading his articles. Uh, next question. Uh, somebody asking, could you help me with the acceptable limits for APC, yeast, and mold in the compressed air and water? Well, uh, since it is Tuesday, 10 at 10, and we answer a baking question, uh, and not talking about compressed air and compressed water and if mold grows in there. It's something that is beyond what we do. And I'm sorry, I wouldn't be able to answer your question uh, and give you the minimum and the maximum uh, allowed. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, how it would affect with the compressed air, maybe putting things on top of your product. But bottom line is, you need to validate it, uh, maybe get a third party, uh, you know, testing lab with a little plate and and see, count the CFU, the colony forming units, and like that, that will give you a sense. But sorry, I can't, uh, I can't answer that for you. I'll move to the next question. Uh, next question, the sorbet levels in cupcake production and how to use a Cupcake production, it all varies. We're talking production. Is this a uh, long production? But the level of sorbate also depends on the targeted shelf life and the water activity because no formula is created the same. If not, that would be, you know, that, mean, that would mean all cake formulas are universal and you have one and one and only. Eggs are not created equal. Uh, flour is just not created equal. It varies from places to places. And the different types of ingredients. So it really has to be dictated by one, what's your shelf life, two, what's your water activity, three, what's your pH, and then you decide what level of sorbate to use. It's super important because just saying put sorbate in, 
we need to know those three things and in order to you know in order to properly uh, educate or, or give a, a a respectable level for your production but good question so go back to doing what i'm saying you know it's like look at your water activity look at your ph of your product and what's your shelf life and what your intended shelf life and what kind of packaging and then you go back to sanitation programs and what do you do in your bakery and and then and it can be assessed how to use it and how much to put next question and there's someone talking about sodium benzoate benzoate used to preserve banana puree so basically when you get it you get some sodium benzoate uh, and sodium benzoate is used as a preservation for mold growth and they want to know that if they use the banana puree then can i use the uh, sodium benzoate that is in the banana puree to basically be used for the muffin as a preservation system that's a great question uh, but if you look on bakerpedia page they list all of the different assets being used as mold preservation system uh, sodium benzoate uh, works in very well in low acidic type of food items. So ideally it prefers five. So and the problem is in muffins, most muffins will get between neutral seven with, you know, seven, seven, two, six, eight, around that range because of it buffering capacity of the baking powder. So right now you're trying to say, I'm going to put my banana puree there one thing that the banana puree will do it will lower your overall ph but to where and and the sodium benzoid that they're putting in the banana puree is done so it preserves your food the banana puree at the right level so now when you put in a banana muffin you're putting between five to ten percent of the total formula percent of banana puree, now it's completely diluted. Is it enough? That I don't know again, not having the data. See, we with baking, especially with cakes, one thing to be very precise is, you know, there's bread baking, which I consider that to be more of an art. You know, you mix, you feel, you stretch, you mix a little more, you proof, you touch and feel. As when it comes down to cake, it's really, you know, we're using two leavening system. We're using bread, we're using a biological leavening system done for yeast. And on cakes, we're using a chemical leavening system to rise up. So on the cake side, I always say it's more chemistry. It's, you have to be more precise to understand how to I dial it, how, what do I do and can I use that? And that's why, you know, we're getting a lot of question on, you know, lev uh, uh, sorbates and sorbic and preservation and shelf life because it becomes more crucial to really pay close attention to the details. It's super important. It's not just we throw it together, we're, we're gone, uh, we don't have to worry because most cakes nowadays have longer shelf life. So, but it was a good question. Uh, I would say it might help you to a small degree, but again, not knowing it's not something I can say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah they don't have to do anything else, but you know, good question. Uh, Baking soda and baking powders packed into clear, flexible pouch. Uh, will the effectiveness decrease? That's a question, you know, uh, for someone who's willing to package it. Uh, it relates to baking, but not directly. But let's answer it. Let's think about it. And most, you know, uh, retail baking soda, baking powder, are in a container and because one thing about baking powder how do they or baking soda how do they react how do they react they react with heat and humidity so now is your clear pouch as the right uh, barrier against humidity versus a sealed uh, thing or versus a box that is pretty tied up you might not and would the light affect the effectiveness i would say yes yes it will because if you have direct light if it's clear and plus uh, uh you know you have in the baking powder you have the soda and the leavening acids and you want them to be preserved to work better longer 
as baking powder, a baking soda, you know, might not be as hygroscopic, meaning wanting water to come in, but you might take away the effectiveness of your product if it was in a clear film. And plus, it's a it's an inexpensive product. So now packing it in a clear pouch, you know, making it, I guess, premium, because usually those type of packaging are more expensive, but therefore, you know, unless there's a market for you and, and people want to see it in fancy, you know, uh, different pouch or different packaging, why not? Why not? But I will, uh, the only way to know that is test and validate. Typically, a baking powder gets a shelf life or baking soda of about a year. So then you have to do a ambient one year shelf life and to see and then validate along the way. And that's something, again, I can help with if you ever interested, but that was a uh, last question. So on that note, so I wish you a beautiful uh, Tuesday and hope to see you next week. And again, happy Tuesday, 10 at 10, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Thank you.